Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today I thought I'd talk about 10 biographies from World War II of World War II figures that I consider to be essential reading on the subject. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just 10 that I really believe every serious student of the Second World War should read. These are both military and political biographies. I think they both do a very good job of illustrating their subject and uh, their role in the Second World War. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, R.J.B. Bosworth's Mussolini is a very good biography of the fascist Italian dictator. It illustrates kind of the the particular motivations he had in setting up the black shirts. They, you know, of course, it it talks about his he was a socialist early on and how that kind of formed his worldview and then kind of how he he transforms in the First World War and around the First World War. Um, into more of a nationalist and how he kind of takes a lot of that, those ideas of kind of mass movement, um, ideas of a mass movement that existed with socialism and how he kind of transports them to uh, the, the fascism that he begins to create. It's a very good book and it does a good job of, I think, illustrating uh, not only his life but kind of the growth of Italian fascism and how that came to later... Um, you know, ultimately not work out with the Second World War. Um, but it, it goes into to his relationship with Hitler and how that kind of develops over the 30s. Uh, another very, very good book uh, and a good biography. That is R.J.B. Bosworth's uh, Mussolini. Next up is a book about a military figure I want to talk about, and that is uh, Patton, A Genius for War by Carlo Desti. Um, this book is a very good biography of... Patton's life, of course, you you you, you kind of see his rather eccentric um, upbringing and his uh, you know where his family he had civil war um, ancestors that he kind of revered, and then ultimately how he uh, joins the army himself. He's involved in the First World War, wounded, and then he kind of laments the fact that there's no wars to fight after the First World War, and then, of course, he, he gets his chance during the Second World War. But I think I think Desti does a good job here of dispelling some myths about Patton. Um, for instance, he kind of shows that, you know, we have, I think most people's touchstone on Patton is the movie, the, the film, Patton. And one, I think it's a very superficial look at the man from that, from that film. Um, Desti does a good job of showing how he was deeply concerned about the lives of his own men. You know, you t the, the, the theory is, ah, just, you know, he was willing to, to throw away lives, but he, he actually was very much concerned for them. He actually developed a holster um, over the shoulder, or, you know, kind of where the gun was on kind of the, 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 the breast pocket there, um, because he was afraid that if the, you know, a pistol sidearm was on the waist, uh, it would inhibit a tanker from being able to quickly get out of the of the tank if there was a fire and there was an emergency. And he was very concerned about things like that. And, um, you know, he said, with regards to the idea that he loved war, he said, well, he certainly loved plying his trade. Uh, he studied and worked for that for years, and he very much relished it. But he also talks about how he genuinely regretted a lot of the death and destruction that happened, I mean, particularly to his own men. Um, and then, of course, the, the, just like I said, the eccentricity of the man. And he, and he talks about how... Um, he was really accident prone, and it's kind of a wonder that that uh, the accident that, that ultimately resulted in his death didn't happen much earlier, because he had many, many different kinds of accidents over the years. Um, but it's a really good, fully fleshed out view of Patton the Man, and this is uh, Patton and Genius for War by Carlo Desti, and again, unfortunately, Desti just passed away here um, about a month or two ago. Very tragic, a great author, and a great book. Next up, I'd like to talk about someone who <clears throat> Patton certainly considered his uh, uh, great antagonist, and that is uh, Erwin Rommel. This book is David Frazier's Knight's Cross, A Life of Erwin Rommel. Um, it's titled The Life of Erwin Rommel. I always kind of thought it should have been kind of The War of Erwin Rommel, because it, he does seem to skip over his early life and World War I and some of these things, I think a little too quickly. But he does a good job of showing um, exactly what happened during the war. He does a good job of showing exactly how the war, um, how, how Rommel perceived the war and his aggressiveness and sometimes how his aggressiveness was to his detriment. You know, there, there were times when he advanced and he advanced when maybe he should have consolidated. Um, but it's, a, it's good. It also, of course, kind of touches on the, the, his role in the um, 
uh, bomb plot, which was minimal, obviously, against Hitler. And then, um, of course, the tragic end where he's forced to commit suicide because of his supposed role in the bomb plot. But a great book about Erwin Rommel. I read this one probably 20 years ago, and it's still just uh, really kind of stuck with me. But this is Knight's Cross, uh, Life of Erwin Rommel by David Fraser. Next up is a... Uh, uh, another book about an American general. This is uh, Marshall, Defender of the Republic by David Roll. Uh, this came out here just a couple of years ago, and it's a good overview of uh, uh, Marshall's life. I say overview, it's, it's, it's a little more detailed than that. Uh, I really like this book. I'd read, I'd read the Hershon's book on Marshall a while back, and I liked that one. I thought that one was good, but what I like about David Roll's is they kind of get, they kind of, he kind of touches on stuff. You, you don't, um, I hadn't seen before, I, I, I knew a little about. For instance, you know, you'd known Marshall had argued for the invasion of France in 1942 or 1943, but I didn't really know the ins and outs of exactly what the sledgehammer plan was going to be. And here they actually talk about the idea of they wanted Marshall's contention, the plan he came up with, <clears throat> was to just seize the uh, Cotentin Peninsula in France and kind of try to flood areas to prevent you know enemy tanks from moving through and just hold that peninsula for the winter uh, consolidating and building up before they could launch a breakout or a second invasion somewhere along the coast so it's it's a very I mean uh, there was a very interesting thing I'd never heard about before or at least I mean I heard about it but not in that detail and he provides some really good detail and the on the operational planning for that and I really like that um, they too he addresses Marshall's humanity when Marshall um, you know, they talk about his relationship with his son, Alan Brown, his stepson, Alan Brown, and kind of just what a blow that was when he's killed in Italy in uh, 44. And, I mean, that, you know, really affected him. But he talks about how he would constantly place um, uh, casualty figures in front of Roosevelt just to remind him of the human cost of the war. And, uh, anyway, very good look at Marshall. Highly recommend it. That is... Uh, George Marshall, uh, Defender of the Republic by David Roll. Next up is a book that, um, this is again one I read a while ago, but this is a very good look at the Soviet uh, dictator Joseph Stalin. This is uh, Robert Service's book, Stalin. Um, Robert Service uh, does an excellent job. He's a, he's a great historian. I read his Lenin as well. I want to read his Trotsky at some point. But this book on Stalin really shows, you know, you know Stalin was a true believer. Uh, in communism, and he was um, completely ruthless and completely merciless. And his, uh, the way he, he, he ran the Soviet Union prior to the war was just chilling, and then once the war begins, it's, it's even scarier. Um, but he does a good job of, of you know, putting, putting to rest the myths, and whenever you call these dictators uh, monsters, sometimes you forget that, well, they're still human, and these are human these are human beings making these horrific decisions. And to that extent, service does a good job of showing his humanity. Um, but it's, it's a, like I say, it's a very good book, uh, particularly the chapters on, uh, the, the war is not a lot, a big part of this book. The, the focus of the book is, I think, much more on his um, <clears throat> consolidation of power and how he ran the Soviet Union. But the chapters on the war are quite good in showing how he takes on more and more power um, during the war, but still not in the same way that, that, that Hitler does. He doesn't insert himself further and further down the chain of command the way Hitler did. But, but he's still very much a hands-on um, uh, figure in the war. And it's a very good. So this is Stalin by Robert Service. Next up is a book on a German general. This is Guderian, Panzer Pioneer or Mythmaker by Russell Hart. Now this is a very brief biography of um, Guderian. But it's good, and I like it quite a bit because it kind of illustrates the fact that you know Guderian, uh, he's often held in high regard by people who, of course, laud his achievements as a as a uh, military innovator. But the author here, Hart, he 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 kind of says yes, but this needs to be shown in the context of his loyalty to the regime, and and, and two, he, he he mentions you know other names um, were, were, of course, very, it was, uh, Lutz was, was the other German pioneer commander you don't hear anything about, but he was the one that really kind of got the ball rolling on armored warfare, and Guderian kind of followed his lead and, and, and took a lot of stuff from him. But, but as I say, he says, you know, whatever achievements Guderian makes has to be seen in, in the context of the, um, of the regime. 
and of his loyalty to the regime and his dedication to Hitler. And he, of course, was one of these generals who profited greatly from the bribes that Hitler paid out. Hitler, of course, bribed his top generals from, from discretionary um, Reich's chancellery funds, I believe. And, you know, Guderian made a lot of money from Hitler. Uh, he was given an estate. He wanted, he wanted this huge estate in Poland, and it would have been b bigger than the field marshal's estate, so he couldn't have that one, so he had to pick another one. But he, you know, was, was essentially paid off for his loyalty to the regime. And then also quite telling is when the bomb plot occurred and Hitler uh, was nearly killed, Guderian was incommunicado. He was out hunting on his lodge and no one could get a hold of him. And so it was very convenient for, uh, for, for Guderian there, a little too convenient. Um, and yet he kind of escapes suspicion and he goes on to become the acting chief of the general staff uh, toward the end of the war. Very good book. This is Russell Hart's uh, Guderian, Panzer Pioneer or Mythmaker. Next up is Martin Gilbert's Churchill, A Life. This is a pretty big book, and it's uh, a good account of Winston Churchill, kind of warts and all. Uh, but nevertheless, having said that, you can very much tell the, the subject is, uh, or the author, rather, is very taken with the subject. Uh, you kind of, you, you gain that appreciation for the fact that here Churchill was this figure who, First of all, before the war, in his warnings about Hitler and his insistence that the the British do something to prepare for war, you know, build up their fighter forces, that was absolutely essential. And arguably, without Churchill before the war making those 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 demands, um, the British would not have been in a position to ward off the battle uh, the Germans during the Battle of Britain. So, right there, that's tremendously important. But also, too, critically, those those that first really month of his prime, min uh, prime ministership in um, May of 1940, when they could have lost it. The British easily could have lost the war. Um, and, and Churchill refused. He said, we're going to keep fighting, even though it looked absolutely hopeless. And his faith that sooner or later the unnatural alliance between the Soviets and the, and the uh, Nazis would break down, and uh, the hope that sooner or later America would get involved. Another very good book, really enjoyed it. This is Churchill, A Life from Martin Gilbert. Next up is um, a two-volume biography of Adolf Hitler. This is Hitler, Hubris, and Hitler, Nemesis by Sir Ian Kershaw. Ian Kershaw is kind of widely recognized as the authority on Adolf Hitler. And this book is just simply um, amazing. Um, Again, I mentioned with Stalin that, that, that tendency we have to talk about these dictators and use that word monster. And what we forget is when we use that monster, it, I think in our minds it kind of um, numbs us to the fact that these were human beings with human agency that made these horrific decisions. And again, you see this with, with Hitler here, and Kershaw does a good, shot, good job of, of showing that. And one of the great innovations that Kershaw comes up with in our way of thinking about Hitler, uh, the, you know, in this book is this this concept of working toward the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer never really had to give out direct orders, say, to, to, to murder the Jews in the Holocaust or anything like that. Um, very often he would just simply imply to his subordinates, well, this is something we should probably do, or, you know, kind of vaguely say, yeah, we want to get this done, we'll have to get this done. And then the subordinates would kind of compete to do that because they knew they would be rewarded, they would gain Hitler's favor. So it was kind of this almost passive leadership that Hitler has in a way that where he just expected the people beneath him to take up take up their um, uh, take up kind of the, their responsibilities as they saw them to enforce the will of, of Hitler. Um, very good book and and a good a good penetrating account of just how horrible and horrific life in Nazi under the Nazi regime was and not just for the people but the people running it were just constantly backstabbing and you know in fear that if they didn't um, if they didn't do what Hitler wanted if they didn't compete if they didn't gain Hitler's favor that sooner or later uh, they would kind of find themselves on the uh, wrong end of the regime um, very good book very good very good book highly recommend this is uh, Hitler uh, the two volume biography Hitler hubris and nemesis by Sir Ian Kershaw next up is Eisenhower in war and peace by uh, Gene Smith um, by Gene Edward Smith 
And this is a good overview of, uh, of course, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower is, um, you know, one of those generals in, in the Second World War that, that uh, kind of enters an American pantheon, kind of like the way many Americans kind of look at, at um, Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and William Sherman and these people from the Civil War. Uh, we have a pantheon from, from World War II, certainly Patton's in there, and, and Eisenhower perhaps is at the head of it. Um, and Eisenhower, of course, later goes on to be president. This covers all of that, but it's a very good, very good look at the evolution of Eisenhower and how he and how he thought and how he made decisions. And you know, Eisenhower is quite controversial, and he made a lot of decisions that I that I disagree with. But you you always get a sense that that, that he wasn't. He was never cynical. He was never disingenuous. He, he kind of did things because he legitimately believed they were the best things to do. And I think case in point, his decision not to go after Berlin. You know, he realized that militarily it was not a target. And of course, Churchill's just on him. Think of the political ramifications. And he said, that's not my job. If I'm ordered to take Berlin by, by the president, I will do it. But if, if I if my job as I interpret it is to smash the, the, the Wehrmacht's ability to resist, and Berlin doesn't do that. So he, I think he legitimately was a, was a, was a honest and sincere person uh, pursuing his goals here in the war. Um, and Gene Edward Smith, of course, really does a good job in, in, in kind of illustrating that. And also, um, you know, the stuff about his presidency, of course, is very good as well. It's just a great book uh, from, from, from uh, start to finish. So this is Eisenhower and War and Peace from Gene Edward Smith. Finally, the last book that um, I'm going to talk about is not just a great World War II era biography. It is also, I think, one of the best bi biographies I've ever read. I uh, really enjoyed it quite a bit. This is Albert Speer, His Battle with Truth by Gitta Serini. Um, this book, of course, Albert Speer is one of the most complex characters to, to come out of World War II. When I was uh, oh, 19 or so, I read his uh, memoirs of the Third Reich, uh, Inside the Third Reich, Memoirs of the Second uh, Memoir. Inside the Third Reich, Memoirs was the title, and uh, at least the English language title. And it was a very interesting book because I never read a book like that that, that kind of took you to the inside of the inner circle the way of Hitler's inner circle as that one did. But Serini's book, good because it, it is good. It looks at that. It looks at his Spandau: The Secret Diaries, and you kind of get a sense of just the um, the uh, as I said, the inner circle of the, that Adolf Hitler went uh, created. You see Hitler very well, very well and very quickly how um, Speer developed this relationship with him and how they worked. And there's the kind of this Faustian bargain almost that develops as Speer kind of hitches his career to Hitler's wagon. And then, you know, Speer was this great technical expert. Hitler eventually makes him his minister. He was an architect. Hitler eventually makes him his minister for armaments and war production. And he's quite good at his job. And I think, you know, as Adam Tooze kind of pointed out in his book on the German war economy, most of the, the innovations that got the German economy into high gear after Speer took office were actually in place before Speer began. They just kind of had their results after he came in and he took credit for him. And that's one of the things too is, is Serini really tries to show where Speer is being disingenuous. And supposedly not long before he died, he called her up, you know, because he had inter she had interviewed him. And uh, not long before uh, he, he died, he called her and, and kind of said, uh, you know, it was in 1980 or thereabouts, he said something to the effect of, you know, I, I he was kind of drunk and he kind of boasted that, you know, he, he'd had this relationship with Hitler and she kind of took this to men, you know, Maybe he didn't really have a lot of remorse for what had happened. Of course, he built his whole post-war career on on remorse and 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 you know, talking, you know, about Hitler in, in a negative way. What else could he have done? And so it's it's uh, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting examination of of conscience and guilt and what his role is, not just in the war, but in the Holocaust and in building this horrible, horrible regime that ultimately was responsible for the death of millions and millions of people. Absolutely fascinating book. Uh, fascinating character, uh, fascinating person, uh, deeply, deeply flawed and deeply troubled person, and a great book. Um, so this is Albert Speer, His Battle with Truth by Gitta Serini. 
Well, thank you for joining me today for these uh, World War II biographies. Um, like I say, I'm going to try to make more of these videos and uh, more book lists and maybe some other fun things coming up. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you to you know, go ahead and leave a comment if uh, you've read and like some of these books or if you have other books that you think should be on a list like this. Uh, let me know what they are. And I'd ask you to go ahead, as I say, subscribe to this channel. I would very much appreciate that. And if you are interested in gaming, uh, board gaming, tabletop gaming, and war gaming, uh, go ahead and check out my other channel, The Discriminating Gamer, and uh, subscribe to that one too. So thank you very much, and uh, have fun.